Bonjour. Good morning, everybody. This feels like a Eurovision preview. Um, <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be back here. This is my third time in this room with you. And uh, yeah, as Larissa said, a huge merci to uh, Xavier and Wikimedia France and all of the partners involved in the uh, fantastic and very important report which you have in your bags today. So let's begin. Merci. Yeah, um, my name is Larissa Borg and um, Douglas McCarthy and I will, are going to talk to you about open access copyright and licensing today and we are going to introduce some of the challenges that some of you already mentioned in your questions to the report uh, that come with open cont content but we we'll also look at the opportunities especially by diving into case studies of um, major and smaller institutions around the world who are adopting open content policies in their institutions. So let's spend a moment or two, not too long, uh, talking about copyright, which is a very important uh, subject matter for this whole conversation. So open access or open content, content or sometimes open glam means that there are immediate upfront permissions for any kind of reuse and a definition which uh, Larissa and I and many other open content researchers and professionals use is the open definition uh, which is created by Open Knowledge International uh, a few years ago. And in a very short summary, it says that open means anyone can freely access, use, modify and share content for any purpose. So this means that uh, these licenses which are listed and specified in the open definition, um, allow people to transform and share materials uh, which are uh, protected by copyright according to the terms of license. And these open licenses permit, and permit uh, full commercial reuse. It's just important to remember, however, that licenses should only and can only be applied by the rights holder. So this is uh, licensing content where there is uh, a sufficient threshold, enough uh, legal support for the content to be worthy of copyright. So one shouldn't use licenses for content which is in the public domain. The Creative Commons licenses will be familiar, I think, to almost everyone in the room. And as you can see there, there is a spectrum from the left-hand side. We have the public domain tools. Uh, the CC0 in use by Paris Musée, uh, the public domain mark. Worth noting that these are legal tools, they're not licenses. These are used to describe and to label content as being in the public domain or with CC0, any possible rights have been given, have been waived by the copyright holder or the institution um, for completely free reuse. I think most relevant for this audience is that the uh, Etalab licence ouverte is uh, approximately equivalent to the CC by attribution license. And finally here in the red zone, uh, you will see non-commercial or no derivative uh, flavors of Creative Commons license. These are not considered to be open by the open content community uh, because they are too restrictive, uh, they are too limiting in what people can do with material which is licensed in this way. So the global picture of open content today, you can see here on this world map, um, this is based on research which I have been leading with my friend and colleague Dr Andrea Wallace since 2018. And today I can share with you that there are over 1,400 institutions all around the world who have released at least some content on open access or open content terms. Um, this is about 90 million uh, records uh, at the time of speaking. And if you would like to dig into the details and see where this material is um, and how has it been licensed, then the uh, Wikidata query here and the Open Glam survey will tell you much more about uh, what's happening in different parts of the world. Here in France, uh, there are currently, according to my research, 68 
institutions. Uh, a few more were added, and thank you, Xavier, and others, <laughs> since the report was published. So that's a good thing, I think. Um, here you see them uh, portrayed on a map. This is created from a Wikidata Sparkle query. And there are almost 8 million digital objects on uh, open content terms, which is yeah, a very uh, a good story and uh, promising. A couple of graphics for you. Uh, open access in France by institution type uh, is on screen here. You can see that yeah, museums represent sort of just under a third, 30%. Uh, libraries, of course, are also important with 23% uh, of open access terms so far. And these are the right statements, legal tools and licenses which are in use. So uh, it's no surprise that the Etalab licence ouverte is uh, popular, uh, as is expressed in the report, has been very useful and uh, particularly by archives and libraries in France. Now. There are some challenges to open content, which are very beautifully expressed in the report and uh, shared today already. But Larissa and I have a couple of extra ones, I think, to talk about today. First of all, we know that, particularly after the uh, global pandemic, that there is more pressure on GLAMs or on museums, libraries, archives and galleries to generate their own revenue, their own income from their assets, particularly their digital collections. Larissa. Exactly. And then there are, of course, uh, the scarce uh, human, financial and technical capacities that museums and other cultural heritage institutions have to suffer right now, especially after the pandemic. And a lot of us are um, on top of that also lacking of exec executive support from the leadership. And copyright itself can be problematic in this space. First of all, it is very long lasting. The original term of 14 years has increased hugely to what we have today. Uh, it's also very complicated. So as culture professionals, that makes it challenging to understand and make decisions about copyright and digital collections. The copyright space is dominated by corporate lobbying. Uh, there are lots of financial interests, for example, broadcasters, media companies, and publishers, uh, as we saw in the recent uh, European Union level uh, lobbying before the copyright directive. And the continuing path of copyright term extension, so copyright becoming longer and longer and longer, ad nauseam, uh, also means that more of the content which should be in the public domain now isn't. So that is a problem. And Larissa? And then we have, of course, always the power of the status quo. Um, it is um, quite, uh, frankly, uh, easier to just stay in the practice and um, work as we always did in the good old days. But um, in, uh, if we want to change something, we have to get away from the status quo. Larissa. Exactly, and I'm sorry. <laughs> <coughs> Slight delay. Um, Douglas and I are often talking about what and how, who institutions are actually for. And in this uh, word cloud, we see some of the uh, words that um, are um, diving up if we are talking about the missions of cultural heritage institutions. So what are the uh, institutions that we are often paying for with our tax taxpayers' mon money? Um, actually serving? Are we serving um, for, for, um, for, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry are we actually serving our societies or are we um, serving economic purposes? What can our collections do for us and for our societies if we actually publish them openly? And in our um, view we have to always think about what are uh, the relationships between our missions and our access policy. Um, open access does work best if it's actually um, uh, well related to the mission of the cultural heritage institutions and if it's also institutionalized in that matter. An open access policy can't stand alone, it's part of a bigger mission, it's part of a bigger mission to be part of society and to drive innovation in a society. 
It's also important to remember that the status quo of closed access, so non-open content, has real-world consequences for many of the audiences and the public that our institutions serve. In the space of art history, which is my personal academic background, um, it's well known and often discussed, particularly on Twitter, where people feel you know, uh, angry or excited, that the status quo of museums who charge money, supply fees, image licensing fees, which can become very, very, very expensive, is a, a break. It is a, a limiter on scholarship. So art museums in particular, sorry, they are often not uh, the best actors in this space. And on screen here, you have two examples from the British press from uh, the last year or two. Uh, the our historian, Dr. Bender Grosvenor, uh, talking about how museum image fees are, uh, you know, are really kind of killing art historical scholarship, and that open content policies much, must be pursued. And the medievalist Catherine Rudy from the University of St Andrews, uh, talking about how the massive costs and expenses of her doing her scholarship around medieval collections, in particular, and medieval period was a long time ago. So you might think, well, that should be in the public domain by now. So closed access actually affects people and it affects learning and scholarship. So as Larissa said, interesting to think about that in contrast to what museums say about their mission and what they stand for. In the European Union, as I mentioned, the probably once in a generation copyright reform of uh, the CDSM directive in 2019. Uh, for this audience, Article 14 is particularly important because it clarified some existing law about uh, works of visual art in the public domain not deserving new copyrights when they are digitized in a straightforward and a quite a simple way. However, as with law everywhere, there is some detail and complications here. The Article applies to um, visual reproductions of artworks, sorry, visual artworks in the public domain is the exact expression. However, visual artwork is not defined very clearly in the legal text. What about maps, scientific illustrations, um, manuscripts, sheet music, books, etc.? So there is some ambiguity here. And one of, the, uh, one of the challenges that we've seen already uh, is that in certain countries, and France is included here, that even if those digital images are not claimed to be in copyright by the museums which have them, they can often use the terms of use to kind of continue to control and to limit access to the content itself. So, it's not always about the copyright status of those digital works. Actually, the condition générale d'utilisation can be used by museums and are being used by museums to almost continue to do the same thing that copyright used to before the legal reform. Larissa, back to you. Exactly, but to actually put you also in a positive context, we wanted to um, end this presentation with some of the use cases of open content around the world. And here you have a beautiful um, example, the Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands. Um, I, if I remember it correctly, um, Xavier already is, um, mentioned uh, them as one of the trailblazers of open content. And what you see here is Rijk Studio, their online collections, um, where they do not only allow users to um, download high resolution images, but also reuse them directly with the possibility um, of um, that economic benefit for the museum itself. So you can use the Rijk Studio to directly uh, make your own creations with, uh, with uh, the works displayed, but they are also giving the users rich metadata that gives the audience a lot of context and information about the works that is, of course, also openly licensed. Um, you have the possibility to create own galleries and to enjoy others as well, um, as well as the museum's own curated content. And then we have the Right Studio Award, um, uh, an annual design competition on reusing the online collections and creating new masterpieces. 
and the institutions um, that actively encourage and reward users um, to reuse their digital collections have been seeing a lot of more um, uh, interactions with their collections. And I see it as a major difference to not only look, let your audience look at online collections, but to actually engage them in new forms of dialogue and relationships between cultural heritage institutions and the audience. Uh, let's take a walk over the uh, <laughs> over the ocean and look at the Cleveland Museum of Art in Ohio, U.S. Um, they have as well online collections that are openly licensed, and uh, they have also a filter on their online collections to let you uh, to let you look just at um, open access content. All of the museum's collections are digitized and their open access in initiative has launched in 2019. And I um, urge you to look at the reports that they have also published online, um, among others on uh, the Open Glam Medium publications, where they reflect upon their, um, their successes. Um, since then, they have uh, more than 3,000 images um, that have been published in the public domain. And I quote um, Alexa uh, Jane Alexander there, um, who has been um, responsible for the open access launch. But they see open access as a logical and exciting outgrowth of the CMA's inclusive mission to create transformative experience through art for the benefit of all the people forever. And um, what you see here are their public dashboards um, where they not only track live data, Uh, on the reuse of their uh, online collection, but they also display how they are used ex externally. So what you see is that uh, they, they get a lot more views for their collections um, on Wikipedia and through their open access API interface um, than on their own collections online. And one thing that is particularly interesting is um, if you go to the dashboards yourself through the link um, on the bottom of the slides, is that different types of artworks are um, successful on different platforms. So even if they are curating some uh, part of the online collections themselves in some way, users on Wikipedia will maybe use, article, uh, will use artworks in different articles that showcase them totally differently and bring them new uh, users. And then I take you home with me to Sweden, um, my last example. <coughs> And this is the Brunsmuseet in Sätrebrunn, Sweden. You might not have heard of them, but um, I urge you to look them up if you're once going to Sweden. Um, it's a volunteer-led um, institution in the middle of Sweden. Um, they have no, um, no um, fast staff, but um, they have uh, volunteers who are actually really dedicated. And this is a project that they have been working on for some time now, Open Source Setrabun. And they are working on making uh, the, um, the um, content on Wikipedia that is available about the museum um, better in their quality and in their density. So what they're doing is that they not only crowdsource how to digitize their collections that they have at the museum, but they are also working with the community on Wikipedia To, um, to work to enhance the quality of articles. Um, next slide. <laughs> so uh, they're also crowdsourcing how to georeference historical maps, how um, historical interviews and videos can be uh, transcribed to increase accessibility. And they together work on a digital dissemination of cultural heritage resource. And if we um, remember that these are volunteers dedicating their free time um, to this museum. This is quite um, impressive. And um, they have been um, really trailblazing what is possible with open access, even if you only have limited resources at hand. So in conclusion, the opportunities, the positive chances for open content uh, for every cultural heritage institution are firstly to make the cultural heritage in your collections genuinely accessible and genuinely reusable by the on audiences that you serve online. 
um, especially with open access, there, there are new possibilities available to drive digital reach and visibility for your institution. Open content fits with the fundamental purpose of cultural heritage institutions, uh, serving the public, increasing knowledge, sharing education is really uh, in their core mission and their values. Open content fits with that perfectly well. And open content can not only be um, innovative um, for you know, the uh, relationships to the audience, it can also be transformative within institutions. So you can actually uh, allocate resources from administration for image licenses to different purposes. And really importantly, open access policies, open content, communicates positive attitudes, positive intent from your institution to your audiences. We all know that many people aren't into the copyright and licensing bubble like we are. So it's important in a very crowded digital space to be as clear as possible. And things like the Culture Libre uh, logo we saw earlier is a really nice example of that. And uh, last but not least, open content empowers education, creativity and new knowledge. And um, especially during the pandemic, we saw incredible um, examples of just that. Merci. Merci. Are there any questions or do we actually have time for questions, <laughs> if there are any? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larissa and Douglas, and uh, uh, I thank you especially, Larissa, because I think, uh, I guess you will be happy to be with us. <laughs> and thank you to make the effort to share the presentation with Douglas today. Uh, vous pouvez poser des questions. Je pense que l'interprète pourra uh, traduire dans l'autre sens, uh, si c'est uh, si c'est possible. Okay, merci. Um, I would like to talk in English because my French is also very schoolboy or schoolgirl, Mason. Um, I'm from Germany and I think what us helped us in Germany very much was also Coding Da Vinci. This is um, a kind of event that um, happens to be since 2014 and it was a way um, to open up some data and to give them to a community within a hackathon to do crazy things with it. Really kind of out of control, but um, several interesting things happened. There were a lot of developers who get a grip on this cultural data and explored them and produced things sometimes very interesting to the museums and archives, sometimes not some like an alarm with um, focal voices from a natural history museum. But I think this really helps a lot of the smaller institutions as this event was com um, combined with Wikidata Germany, I think also, and they help them to digitize, to get the data in a shape that was explorable and to provide them. And I think this was for a lot of museums a first easy try how to open and how to provide accessible and reusable data because the reuse is the only way to take care for data. If people do not use data, also data gets old. So this is really important and maybe this is an idea to do something like this in France too. Yeah, that's a great example. We have something different, uh, something uh, similar in Sweden as well. Um, and um, I think hackathons are a great example of also putting together institutions with users. Because in my view, we sometimes stretch this narrative of uh, the dangerous um, audience in um, ways where um, institutions, for example, highlight these uh, dangers of reuse. What will happen to collections if they are sh uh, shared with the audience? Will they misuse um, our data? And putting together users with institutions and actually showing them positive examples of um, reuse and positive examples of users um, can be quite reassuring. 
Oui, bonjour. Moi, je voudrais savoir où en est la réflexion en Italie, notamment sur les, les grandes institutions italiennes, sur l'open le, content, euh, les grands musées comme ceux de Florence, le Vatican, etc. Ah. Um, Douglas, the question was about Italy. If you could give some of your, um, could have, if you could some of your uh, data or an in, insight into your data about Italy, about the Vatican and uh, the major institutions there. Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me clearly? Um, Italy is an interesting example because the cultural code of Italy uh, says that. Uh, Italian cultural heritage institutions must charge, they must charge something in order to uh, provide access to their public domain collections. That is particularly interesting after the Italian government and the culture ministry have adopted the copyright directive from 2019. So the cultural code of Italy is still above what the commission's copyright directive says. So I think This leaves Italian uh, colleagues and friends and museums in a slightly unusual and uh, uncertain place because the legal context from the European Union says this, from the Commission, and their own national law, which of course is probably more important and more relevant to them. I think we saw this in the report that your regional uh, city, our, uh, city government or the culture ministry is more important than people, organizations who are further away. They often dominate your thinking. And I think we don't know yet how this will uh, happen in Italy, but we can say that open content in Italy at the present time is quite rare and is limited, unfortunately. Thanks for the question. I think it's also um, a good question in context of the, um, the context of cultural values. Um, and cultural um, perceptions of uh, culture. Um, if I, for example, I'm also from Germany, but when I moved to Scandinavia, I totally um, perceived a totally different notion of um, openness in culture. And this is partly because of uh, the Scandinavian or the Swedish um, concept of uh, the um, public having access to, for example, culture and nature in a totally different way. Um, where people actually expect to have access, for example, to rune stones, to um, natural uh, heritage, and so on. Euh, je, je voulais compléter ce que la réponse de, de Douglas concernant la situation de l'Italie, euh, qui est tout à fait... Euh, effectivement, la situation est compliquée. L'Italie est très, très peu engagée dans l'open content. On a quand même le musée égyptien de Turin, qui est euh, l'exemple euh, véritablement depuis, depuis plusieurs années, sous l'impulsion de son directeur euh, Christian Greco, qui est en licence euh, CC BY, si je me souviens bien. Euh, mais en effet, il y a la loi du Code des biens culturels qui... Euh, euh, exige une autorisation et euh, qui même va jusqu'à fixer un prix, une redevance euh, pour toute utilisation de, des images euh, du patrimoine euh, euh, national. Euh, ce que je voulais simplement dire, c'est qu'il y a eu des débats euh, l'année dernière euh, dans le cadre de l'étude par le Parlement de l'application de la directive européenne euh, de 2019, euh, qui était même retransmis en direct, que j'ai suivi par intérêt, et dans lesquels on a vu des tenants de l'Open Content Christian Greco lui-même, certains grands directeurs de musées qui venaient euh, présenter euh, par exemple des éléments euh, tels qu'on trouve dans le rapport d'ailleurs euh, comme euh, les, le fait qu'il ne faisait pas de recettes avec la vente des images euh, bah, le directeur du musée de Naples a donné des chiffres euh, donc on a eu des débats extrêmement clairs pour et contre euh, qui ont été retransmis alors je ne sais pas où ça en est exactement maintenant ce que je dirais simplement c'est qu'en France on n'a vraiment pas eu les mêmes <rire> on n'a pas eu de commission de, de débat retransmis de la commission culture au parlement par exemple euh, on, a, on ne sait pas où ça en est en réalité, hein, on, où en est la transposition la directive. Euh, donc voilà, on, on avait une certaine dynamique en Italie il y a quelques temps, bien qu'en effet la, la situation soit aussi complexe qu'en France et pour, pour des raisons différentes. I have a question for your all two experts. Uh, last month, the director of uh, National Finnish Gallery uh, announced that he's considering a reversal of its open ac access policy in an attempt to monetize collections data and generate new revenues. Do you think that the economic impact of COVID-19 
uh, for the museums uh, could be a reason to slow down or interrupt the shift uh, to open content by some international museums or art institutions. Larissa, would you um, like to go first? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I think you're um, referencing a really interesting example of the uh, recent debates. Um, and there has been a response to um, that statement uh, issued by uh, leading experts in the realm, also from Finland. Um, maybe we can share it on Twitter later. Um, otherwise, you are going to find it if you're just uh, looking at the Museo Verasto, uh, which is the Swedish, uh, the Finnish um, Association of Museums. Um, in uh, for answering your actual question, actual question is that um, I don't think that the pandemic is going to slow down open access in the cultural heritage realm, and that's for the reasons that. Um, uh, the pandemic has shown us uh, as institutions and also um, in the institutions that I have been, I have been working at um, that people are actually craving access to cultural heritage. What they are not craving is actually um, trying, is barriers. Um, and I think um, even if there are um, some um, important struggles right now in the end, some um, dramatic struggles in the art world um, and the museums world um, worldwide, especially in uh, nations where uh, museums are um, privately funded, um, I think we are um, going to see more uh, um, streams of revenue. P uh, museums are going to uh, search for more possibilities to actually diversify how they're making money. Um, but as Douglas and I showed in the presentation, um, image, licenses, uh, image licensing is not um, a successful mode of um, revenue generation. And... Um, I think that uh, museums and glams have to be more creative and there are no, um, no barriers to actually monetizing on your collections um, as long as you also have open access. Um, and I think we have some great um, examples even in the um, spreadsheet that uh, Andrea Wallace and Douglas are um, curating and researching. Um, where um, GLAM still um, sell um, their collection or monetize on their collection by, um, um, by um, creative products, um, but still have open access to their online collections. And I encourage you to look at the Reich Studio, uh, the Reich's Museum's uh, online collections, where you can create um, a load of products on their, um, based on their collections yourself. Um, and still you can get access to their knowledge and their uh, collections. Yeah, thanks Larissa. And just to add to that, one of the interesting things about the Finnish National Gallery uh, example is that the relatively new director of the gallery has now come out and said, this isn't official policy. He was thinking aloud on his official blog. <laughs> hmm. uh, you know, interesting. But there are no plans to, you know, roll back from the CC0 license that they adopted, I think, in 2019. Um, however, I think this is an interesting moment to consider how that connects to the report that we, you know, we're celebrating today. Because one of the challenges which is expressed in there is that often open content as a practice, the professionals here in this room and our colleagues who can't be here, is a relatively fragile thing because it can be one or two or more passionate, committed, expert individuals who really believe in it, you know, and push it forward. But in order for it to become sustainable, it really has to be incorporated and connected for the mission of the institution and advocated for very deliberately and positively by the top executive leadership, the higher management structures, the museum or library director, in order for it to last and to become sustained over a number of years. So the Finnish example just shows that when you have new leadership, they start thinking aloud about, hmm, open access doesn't make us any money, maybe we need to think about Web3, how does that work? You know, one individual is apparently able to change the direction of the policy of uh, an entire national institution. So um, when I read the similar, I think, uh, expression in the report, it, it connected me with that. So 
Thank you.